Ya. Uzar diyor oğlum köpeğe düz oğlum mangını pakat Mene hemen sem tardır koçalar kim dur koçalar Raplerimizde pen bilen tem İç yıldı yızıldı sızıldı gep Buzulmaydı o bizdik sem Alem kalemden maharet yok Tapkan teginin kuruk söyle Tökmet arlaş tekisler Ağım bizden hakkını bop derler Sendeki mendeki mendeki sendeki Sahtık ağırlaşmaz kepler Soklar öttü baştan acızlık Kan bilen yaştan kalemem maciz İdiya saksız itiştim bop bir takkasız Külürüm tülürüm yalguzluk Yüzlürüm közlürüm bop tatuk Trişt kırşt kırşt trişt Emre aşı san yalguzluk Goddam Bırak motherfucker well, welcome everybody. My name is Sasso Estrada. I will be your moderator. And we have an exciting, just an exciting panel for you. I, I had the pleasure of listening to most of them practice. And you, you're in for a real treat um, to learn about China and uh, the myths and facts. And so uh, we're going to start off with Dave Smokler, who is going to offer a wonderful narrative about how this group came together. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to see all you. Comrades and friends, my name is Dave Smoker. I'm a member of Learn of Detroit. I'm an activist, a retired attorney and high school teacher of adjudicated youth and Detroit public school students. I'm also a revolutionary, so it's a special interest to me to be presenting this today because we're, we, we're, I want to see a different system in this country, and now we can see how China has created a different system. In January of 2021, Members of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America, Detroit, began an in-depth in study of the contemporary world. After much discussion of different paths and recognize the pivotal role of China, we decided to embark on this project with an examination of the People's Republic of China. Most of us hadn't revisited the subject since the Chinese Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and 70s. Our aim was to discover China and Chinese socialism through the lens of the Chinese themselves. Our work embraced China's revolutionary process from the opening wars of the 1840s to the creation of the new China in 1949, led by Mao Zedong, through its land reform, industrialization, opening up led by Deng Xiaoping, and on to contemporary China, led by Xi Jinping, president of China and chairman of the Communist Party of China. We were fortunate to make a Facebook friend of Dana Burton from Detroit. He suggested readings to begin our study. Dana had brought hip hop to China and you saw the video there, uh, that was Dana's work. His influence is evidenced by the video at the beginning of the presentation. I'd like to give a shout out to Dana Burton from Dexter Avenue neighborhood in Detroit, Michigan. We also studied Marx's classics, including Critique of the Gotha Program and Thesis on Fuhrbach, as well as works by Mao Zedong. We learned about the nation of China, its history, culture, Marxism, and its non-Western world outlook as the oldest continuous civilization in the world. As stated on our webpage, the socialist countries realized a successful nation was only possible if the governance reflected the will of the people. We found this to be particularly true of China, which follows the mass line from the people to the people, meaning they go to great efforts to solicit the views of the people. And then after much study and debate, convert these views into policy from the people to the people. They do not just focus on theory, but the practical terms of improving people's lives. China goes to great lengths to describe social society in a holistic manner, not just in economic terms. As President Xi Jinping has stated, what is concerning is cultural confidence. It is more than social science. Cultural confidence is expressed in the material, spiritual, systematic life and values of a whole of the whole China has the, as its 5,000 year history. It is this long history and self-belief that is the issue. An overriding and important aim for us was to use what we had learned from China to assist us in developing our own ideas, not only about the contemporary world, but also about imagining socialism with American characteristics. We named our group, the International Study Collective, created a website where we archived our weekly classes, materials, and videos. As our work developed, 
we added LERNA and non-LERNA members to our collective and began to work with the LERNA International Committee. Recently, the National LERNA Revolutionary Education Committee offered us the opportunity to present our findings in a National LERNA video conversation. We hope you find our presentation as fascinating and education, educational as we have and look forward to seeking truth from facts. Thank you. Beautiful. So we're going to start our panel. Each panelist will have about 10 minutes to speak. And then um, afterwards, you will have time to ask questions if any. So uh, David Smokler is going to come on first, and he is going to be speaking about Chinese governance. And I believe that is it. That was a whole, or just governance, my bad. I was particularly interested in the governance issue, being an attorney and being a high school teacher of social studies. This was a very difficult assignment for us in the West. I'm doing the best I can. We're only lay people studying China. The issue, how, the issue was, how do you create a truly representative democracy or what is called socialism? In China, all classes and political parties that fought against feudalism, bureaucratic capitalism, and Chinese, and excuse me, and Japanese, the Japanese invasion, participate in this progress, in this process. People want a better life. People want peace and prosperity and harmony. How do you accomplish that? The masses in everyday life discuss what kind of life do they want? It involves constant study and discussion at all levels of society. It involves constantly practicing and improving their democracy. Having said that, I'd like to try to give you a picture of how they do this. Let's explore the ideas and institutions that they have created. Remember, socialism in China is a work in progress. So I'm gonna take this step at a time. As I said, this is very difficult. It's much different than what, what we uh, experience here in the West, what we experience in the United States. It's a much different system than we're used to. I'll start off with history. Chinese are what makes scholars call a civilization state. Its 5,000 year history makes it the oldest continuing civilization in the world. It has never established colonies. China has always looked inward, not outward, with a cultural emphasis on unity. Sovereignty. Sovereignty is the key stone of democracy. China has engaged in a hundred year struggle for sovereignty. From the anti-colonial opium wars in the 1840s until its liberation in 1949. You cannot have democracy if your country is being run by a foreign power. You cannot have liberation without unity. Socialist democracy is a work in progress. It is inaccurate to impose a Western or capitalist model of democracy onto China. This is a false universal that has different origins and contexts representing different class interests. The term used to explain China's form of democracy in Chinese is the people act as master and take on the responsibility of the house. A key example of unity that I've spoken of is its united front strategy as to political parties and as to class. The Communist Party of China is a party of agricultural workers they were mostly tenants and day laborers and urban workers. It is united with eight smaller political parties that fought with the CPC in the revolution and are part of its governance system today. The Chinese national flag has one large star with four small stars, symbolizing the united front with the Communist Party leadership, the big star, and the classes composing the united front rural agricultural workers, urban workers, the small business, and the national business classes. These classes fought together against the feudal landlords and the large businesses aligned with the colonial states. The Chinese call this the people's democratic dictatorship. Democracy for, for, the, for the patriotic elements of society and a dictatorship those, for those who who represented class interests and represented foreign powers. 
The de democratic concept that the Chinese abide by is called the mass line, which, solic which solicits opinions of the broad mobilized masses whose views are studied and then become the views of the central system, elevating them into action. Their core human right is, in social society, is socioeconomic well-being. All other rights, civil, political, cultural, environmental rights flow from this core right, socioeconomic well-being. I'm going to address some socialist institutions that they've created for their democracy. These are much different than the ones we have here, and they were very difficult for me to, to understand. I think I finally kind of got it. The CPC's aim is not to have a party state. It has continued and refined its governance system established in the Soviet red base areas during the revolutionary struggle. Its authority is indirect rather than direct, based upon the country the concept of ruling the country according to law. Policy decisions of the CPC do not automatically become law. They must go through a complete statutory process to become a decision of the state and must be approved by the People's Congresses from the National People's Congress down to the Township People's Congresses with all levels electing their respective governmental bodies. Every citizen over the age of 18 has the right to vote not restricted by any factor, whether ethnicity, sex, occupation, or education. It must be emphasized that all statutes and policies must go through an extensive research and discussion, literally by millions of people. Government officials must demonstrate extraordinary intelligence, competence, and self-discipline. China's whole process democracy emphasize the need for constant reform and improvement, including improving the system of elections, increased voter education, and constantly improving the supervision of the organs of, of, of governance. Next to the People's Le Legislative Assemblies are what they call the People's Consultative Conferences. People from different sectors participate in national political life through a system of social, participation in the deliberation and administration of state affairs. Not simply social organizations, unlike bourgeois civil society in opposition to the state, but specific organizations bearing a mass character with deep political and historical roots. They are representative of public matters not directly connected to, with governance. I'd like to give another shout out to Bill Meyer, whose progressive film cinema has been showing films on China every week. The film Mao Zedong and Kui Ba Shi, a famous Chinese artist, showed how artists and writers participate in the People's Consultative Con Conferences. Instead of viewing the state as intrusive, untrustworthy, and threatening, the Chinese see themselves belonging to a family state and their politicians as family patriarchs. They value collective over individual well-being, the, over individual well-being, the future over the present, and pragmatism over ideology, and outcomes over promises. Minority nationalities are part of the consultative democracy. All minority nationalities have the freedom to develop their spoken and written languages and to maintain or reform their customs and religious beliefs. The governmental structure is committed to assisting the people of the minority nationalities in developing the construction of their political, economic, cultural, and educational institutions. Grassroots democracy integrates local governance structures of CPC committees, people's congresses, people's political consultative congresses, and mass organizations. It has a significant degree of autonomy. The rule of law in China ensures both rights before the law as well as responsibilities. China does not have a one party rule, authoritarian as it's claimed, or a one person rule. It has the rule of law, laws created by its governance structure. The two sessions is the annual plenary sessions of the People's Congress 
and the People's Political Consultative Conference, which occurs after serious study of, prospe of prospective legislation and policy. This year, the CPC is collecting online opinions, soliciting what the Chinese call wisdom of the masses. The Chinese Communist Party National Representatives Congress is held every five years and strictly abides by inner party democracy. This collective process is known as democratic centralism. Decisions are made democratically. Once consensus is reached, they are collectively put into practice. In conclusion, the construction of China's socialist democracy is a work in progress in real time and in the real world. Marxism govern, is the governing party. This Marx, this, oh, creatively applying Marxism, the governing party of the CPC represents the masses of working people in a united front with other parties and other patriotic classes. Its whole process democracy of unity, cooperation, and consultation assumes the need for constant improvement and reform. Its aim is a cooperative governance system and, and, uh, and seeking truth from facts. Rather than an adversarial process, like we see in the United States, largely representing the interests of private property, the CPC understands that if it does not have the support of the people, its socialist project will fail. Its socially oriented economy has doubled everyone's salary every decade for the past 40 years. A 2020 survey found almost 85% of the Chinese saying democracy is important compared to 75% for Americans and 71% say my country is democratic compared to 49% for Americans. World value surveys found 83% of Chinese compared to 38% of Americans saying that their country is run for everyone's benefit rather than that of privileged groups. The Chinese people are working hard to realize the Chinese dream of the people's desire for a good life, the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, and a community of common destiny for mankind. Thank you. We're going to see a video now of the two sessions that I mentioned earlier. Thank you. All right. Thank you, David. That was amazing. That's the wrong one. I know, I know. I thought I clicked to the other window. Here we go. China's two sessions. The annual gatherings of the National People's Congress and the National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference offer observers a window into the idea and practice of whole process people's democracy, which has become a buzzword in China's political arena over the past years. During roughly a week, nearly 3,000 NPC deputies and around 2,000 members of the CPPCC National Committee perform their duties including the deliberation of various legislative items and the review and discussion of a series of work reports, to garner the common ground and convergence of interests of the Chinese people. Democracy originally right, meant rule of the people and by the people. Actually, the, the two sessions are an example of this. This is multi-tiered, right? No single person can just influence the, the, the control the whole process. I think it's at central level and at regional level where um, the bills are being uh, um, pushed in in the public, uh, are being read actually uh, uh, to the public, uh, and the public can give comments to the spokesman office uh, through a consultation process. Now, I can tell you, <laughs> this is more transparent than anything I've seen in France or in England. <laughs> then, uh, uh, this is a case for transparency, which means um, it, it, it is um, uh, uh, something which is increasing the relevance and the fact that actually Bez Lianghui are not uh, uh, uh, rubber stamp effective because of the consultation to the public. All right, so now we are going to open up to questions. If you have a question, you can chat it or comments. Um, you're also welcome to raise your hand and ask it. And uh, okay, Yolanda says, I watched a Chinese documentary about three years ago. It was about Tiananmen Square, the Tiananmen Square massacre. Can't remember the exact place, name, nor the year in China in the 1980s. 
The film said those massacred were communists. Why were they killed? Uh, you know, it's interesting because, um, and I, I mean, I'm not just going to add here that that we get bombarded with so much anti-Chinese propaganda, whether it's in popular culture, the news, and when people think of China, I think they think Tiananmen Square. So uh, who wants to take this one, David, or any of the panelists, if you want to jump in, but David? How about Corallo? You want to take this, Corallo? <laughs> Is he a panelist? Go ahead, ahead Corallo. <laughs> You have to unmute yourself, brother. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is a, a, a, a question sounds to me like a, a just a made up story. Uh, I came from China. I was in Beijing the next day of the June 4th. And uh, I watched the streets. It's not as said you know, how many people killed and the blood over the streets? There's none of them. There, are, there were soldiers. There were some uh, loss of life. But, uh, you, uh, you know, when you have the uh, big events like that, uh, influence from outside, the number of the people who uh, lost their lives are very limited. And uh, I do believe Chinese government did give the correct information. Uh, anyway, there's so many are talking about it, but uh, there's no evidence about it. There's no exact number. Mm. Uh, they just uh, keep on making stories. That's very sad the facts were there. If anyone goes to the facts, you will see how that event was. Thank you. All right, Corolla. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Uh, up next, Rosemary. Yes, could you elaborate on the view of the common destiny for mankind? How do they define that and elaborate on it, please? I think that's really going to be covered by our presentation of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, if you can just hold that and wait, because that because the Belt and Road Initiative talks about mankind. Maybe Wiley could respond to that if you wish. Thank You're you. on mute, Wiley. Have I muted myself? Sure, yeah. have, comrade. Go okay, ahead. I, I'll make a very brief, brief comment. Uh, David's right, but the common destiny of humanity, I'll say it as briefly as I can, is a recognition on the part of China that their destiny is bound up with the destiny of humanity and the planet as a whole. That's where we are. And as a result of that, China recognizes that whatever they gain internally has to be shared, has to be pushed for, has to be fought for the whole of humanity. So that's the most simple meaning. The most simple term is, is proletarian internationalism in practice. I'll stop there. All right, thank you, Wiley. So I, I call on myself and um, I, I am not as well studied as the comrades here, but one thing that fascinates me is this whole idea uh, of how the governance is in terms of democratic, and two, that the minorities have a voice and are encouraged to practice their culture and religion. Because what we hear in the US oftentimes is, oh, communists are anti-religion, which is total BS. Cuba has a lot of Catholic churches, even the Soviet Union has, you know, uh, a large Orthodox and, and, other, and other groups. But my real, my real question has to do with um, how, how, how, I'm not even a question, it's a comment. So I'm from Chicago and uh, we've been pushing this bring the vaccine to the people ordinance for over a year and a half. And if you want ordinances to die, they go to the rules committee. It's been in the rules committee for over a year and a half. And the ordinance would have brought testing vaccines to the communities. It would have increased jobs. It would have hired more health care workers, but the mayor doesn't want this, right? And I was thinking, imagine if this was brought to the People's Congress 
it would have been a completely different story, right? Um, so I, I don't know how to uh, frame it as a question. I guess may, maybe when, when maybe when the people have an idea, how, how does it get pushed forward, right? Let's say they want to have an ordinance to, I don't know, start a new uh, a new road system that's electronic, you know, because they foresee problems with global warming or whatever. How would that come about? Does that make sense? You're asking me? Yeah. Well, the, the people's um, uh, Congress from the very, from the very, from the smallest community has people's Congresses and whatever, and they're always soliciting the views of the, of the people. So it would go up, it would go up the level from the smallest community, depending on where, where it started up until, up to the largest community. Uh, if it was a local question, we'd be dealt with locally. But um, I know that Richard is going to present, part of his case is going to be present a presentation on, uh, on the COVID, zero COVID, COVID tolerance policy. But I see that Sharon has a question about the one child policy. Right, but before her was Yolanda, so I'd like to go in order, but go ahead, speak, speak sure. to her question and then we'll call on Yolanda next. Thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, they had the one child policy when they were developing, industrializing, they just couldn't afford to feed that many mouths. But now that they are developed, they have set aside that policy. And now, as I understand it, and Kerala can confirm that, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no limitation on how many children you can have. Part of that is the population is aging. So they need more children, they need more people. Thank you. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, Yolanda, do you wanna ask your question or make a comment? And you're muted, sister. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions and I, I saw a little comment here. So my two questions are this. I know it was resolved, I remember about, about 2013 or so, or, or 2012. There was a lot of information, a lot of news reports about how the phone workers, I believe it was not a Chinese phone company, but they were paid at low wages. They were committing suicide. So the company finally agreed, or I don't know if it was China Rose that agreed to raise the wages. So I'm glad that was kind of taken care of. Uh, and and then I also, so that's my question. What happened? What, how much power do the foreign companies have versus the Chinese Communist Party? And also, I read an article in the Chronicle, a small article that about six, seven years ago, there were China had the most billionaires in the world, over 580. And two of them is a, a Chinese woman who has money in uh, restaurants and, and hotels. And I've heard that they come to the United States and they buy property, they bought the lady who had a, a building for the Revolution Reports Brigade. They, they, they, they, they, she had a lease and they said, forget the lease. They, they, they paid a million dollars and she, and she was evicted. Um, and then also, I was wondering, and somebody asked, how does China control the billionaires? So uh, I support China. Um, I've also heard that the president was trying to control rein in the corporations, and, and recently he changed that policy, the ones that are in China, because apparently he was afraid that the Biden administration would sanction him. So I know they're trying, I'm pro-China, the Chinese people I live around and that I've had good luck to to be in um, north from here from my father and myself and other places they're very good people I I, I, I highly value and honor uh, I highly respect the Chinese Americans that come in from China so I'm not against China I, I think it's a beacon of hope for especially the poor people of the world all right, thank you Zayn, for your thoughtful okay. feedback. And so I'm just going to roll her question in with Steve Miller's question. As, as she said, he wants to know how China controls its billionaires and how China controls foreign corporations and financial penetration. So I think it jives with what Yolanda's asking. Thank you, Yolanda. I think Tobin and maybe Wiley could answer that. Tobin, Tobin is going to be presenting on the socialist market economy. 
All right. So how, why don't we hold on to that question? Um, and then one more, and uh, we, we do have some time here. Um, Joy says, can you talk more about what your study group understands about the relationship of the political reality in China relates to the economy specifically? David talked about the United Front and the CPC, which relates to the existence of different classes. What does the working class look like look like see itself in this context and how might it relate to what we see as a new class globally? And she, she recognizes this is a complex question. But I'll also hold that if that is gonna be addressed later in the presentation, I just don't know how it goes. All righty. What do you think brothers? You wanna, you, know, you wanna answer that now or you wanna wait till later? Wiley, you wanna unmute? You, you gotta unmute brother. You're still muted. May I say, as he's getting prepared, you are- One thing I can say at the beginning is <laughs> the statistics that I, that I quoted at the end, you know, the working class's income has doubled every 10 years for the last 40 years. So this is a work in progress. You know, they, they, they came from a situation where they were one of the poorest countries in the world, rife with illiteracy, poverty, uh, disease. Their life, their life expectancy has doubled since then. So I think that that, that, in, that can, be, can be talked about in more detail when we get to uh, Tobin's presentation on the socialist market economy and Wiley's presentation on the Belt and Road Initiative. But if anybody wants to add on to what I've just said, please feel free. I, I just think, uh, Danish folks, I think it, it, Joyce's question, both of those questions are important questions, but they probably handle better after Tobin's presentation and after my presentation, uh, because we sort of contextualize it with those presentations, but they're very important questions. So we're in a dilemma because they should be addressing me, but I, my suggestion is we wait to after those presentations, we would be in a good place. All right, so why don't we move on um, and let's, yeah, let's move on. And I see Howard, your question. I think that one we can answer towards the end. Um, so up next we have Tobin who is going to be speaking about socialist market economy, Tobin and Stephanie, it looks like both. So yeah. take it away. Hey, hey. Um, good afternoon, uh, comrades, uh, friends, uh, fellow travelers, friends of the league. Uh, uh, my name is Tobin Sterrett and I wanna thank you for taking the time to be with us. And I hope this will be value, valuable to you in some way. Uh, I also want to point out this was a collaborative effort between myself and Stephanie Reich right there. I'm going to be presenting, but this was a collaborative effort. Uh, Stephanie's been a good friend and valuable contributor to our collective. And I'm just nothing but gratitude for her hard work and input. So this presentation is going to be necessarily brief uh, on China's socialist market, econ market economy. Uh, the purpose is going to give basic working idea of what the socialist market economy is right there too. And I think uh, maybe the questions will flesh out some of what uh, I don't, uh, is not in this uh, presentation, but uh, let's jump, let me jump right into it here. Um, what it is, China defines their basic economic system as one wherein public ownership is dominant and diverse forms of ownership are encouraged to develop alongside it including uh, entrepreneurial enterprises, privately owned enterprises, and foreign enterprises. Uh, competition is encouraged between private and public sectors, but uh, profit does not dominate. And this is what public ownership means uh, currently at this stage in China's development, is all these enterprises have a responsibility at heart to the interests of the Chinese people. And this responsibility is actually enshrined in Article 6 of the Constitution of the People's Republic in China. And when the Chinese speak of socialism, they're not talking about a romantic utopian socialist vision, but what Fred Engels kind of defined as uh, scientific socialism, whose task was not to manufacture a system of society as perfect as possible, but uh, to examine the historical economic succession of events from which these classes and their antagonism had of necessity sprung and discovering the economic conditions thus created the means of ending the conflict. In other words, uh, you gotta look at where you've come from, where, how the circumstances developed and, um, and how to move forward from where you are. And uh, I think this is important because it speaks to the confusion that many outside of uh, China, who, uh, like those of us who've come up in capitalist countries have when they're looking at an economy that identifies itself as socialist, 
uh, yet appears to many to have all the earmarks of a capitalist system we're familiar with. Um, I'll note too that every country that has had any measure of success establishing socialism has taken some variation of the scientific approach. And what comprises China's economy are two entities working together, a market-driven sector and a state-owned sector. Uh, the advantage that the market sector has is its dy dynamism and its capability of allocating resources based on supply and demand. It's able to generate the capital that's, that's been so crucial to their development. We're talking like a relatively brief period of time, uh, under 40 years, in a way that government planning alone cannot manage. And planning is important. That is part of uh, that is part of the apparatus, but uh, the market system is also a huge driver in that. Uh, banks and heavy industry, like energy production, for instance, are largely under state ownership. They're encouraged to compete with one another, but they're both strictly regulated, and neither one of these sectors is allowed to dominate or interfere with the other's performance. When private companies, foreign, domestic, or do business with China, they do so with the understanding that they do not act in violation of the laws set forth by the governance structure that protects private ownership. And uh, yeah, billionaires uh, are there, but they do not form an oligarchic class. They don't uh, influence undue control over the politics or the government, and neither do the corporations. They are answerable to the government if they're in violation of the law. And China was not the first or the only country to utilize market forces as a component of its socialist planning. Uh, we find precedence in this at least as far back as the new economic plan in 1921 in Russia. In uh, post-revolutionary, post-war Russia, it was essential for raising the living standards of people. Uh, and um, it was a, uh, it, a private industry was allowed to flourish. The ban on agricultural town markets was lifted and farmers were allowed to sell their harvest. But uh, banking, finance, and heavy industry, again, remain under state control. And this was, um, this was the model that uh, Mao Zedong had studied uh, when he utilized a variation of this combination in the 1950s with emphasis on balancing agricultural and inter industrial development and adjusting that balance as necessary. Now, uh, they, they worked uh, under a uh, completely planned economic model in the industrial sector, uh, it was, it was uh, the purpose, the uh, vision was that the industrial sector would develop dramatically and the goal is to create the conditions for a transition to socialism, which all production would have a social character. All the essentials of life would be taken care of. And it had some remarkable achievements initially, uh, not the least of them being that it set an example that informed the work of subsequent leaders uh, going right up to uh, Xi Jinping today. But it could not achieve what uh, Mao had envisioned and what followed Mao's death uh, in 1976 and at the end of the Cultural Revolution is perhaps probably one of the most hotly debated topics about China by the political left outside of China, particularly in the West. So we get to this great turning point in history. Okay? At its inception, this fundamentally different approach to building socialism, uh, as it's known in China today, it actually began rather modestly and it began in the rural sections, in the agricultural section. The country was facing another hunger crisis by the late 70s. So in 1978, the household responsibility system of agricultural production was implemented in rural areas in consultation with farmers uh, living and working there. The farmer's land uh, was sectioned off into portions in which one section was used to produce food for the government and another was used for producing crops for the farmer to sell at market right there. So. He could uh, sustain himself and his family, and uh, they managed to stave off a potential hunger crisis and allowed farmers to make a decent living and feed their families. But this is a very difficult transition. Uh, it's pointed out, and rightly there too, that uh, these next couple of decades, uh, inequalities would uh, would increase, um, and uh, it was. Uh, it was a continuation of the path that started in 1949. Was gradually being Realized, but there were a couple. Uh, there were a couple of tough decades here. I'm going to get to. So this this was not uh, what followed 1978 um, was not a terribly controversial break from the Mao era when his successor Deng Xiaoping made the decision to delink the concepts of markets as being solely the realm of capitalist systems and give the market forces freer reign. 
Markets are not unique to capitalism, they predate capitalism. But by the same token, capitalist systems also involve planning, go to very different ends. But what made it controversial is that this move opened the economy up to uh, an exponentially uh, greater degree of risk and a potentially perilous path if it was not handled correctly. And I'll say a bit more about this in a moment. It, awful, it also offered unprecedented potential. So if done correctly to harness the forces of capital and to turn it to building the kind of prosperous, technologically advanced society that was envisioned for and fought by Deng's predecessors, seen as one of his major contributions to the foundation of the economic model that drives China's system today. So the 1980s and the 1990s in particular were turbulent decades in which China's future could have gone in any one of a number of directions. The era that Chinese scholars and historians dubbed the wild 90s were the closest that the Communist Party actually came to losing their directive and what was the focus of their economy, uh, building socialism and a more prosperous society for the people of China. Uh, there was corruption within the party and global neoliberal economic trends uh, were gaining a lot more appeal in China. And, and uh, that also applied to, uh, that also affected the, itself within the, kind of the, uh, the party's ranks. So those were among a couple of the uh, contributing factors. Uh, freeing up of market forces, you know, it always carried significant uh, potential risks and money in China saw opportunities to expand global trade turn China away from its social, socialist directive completely and in a more capitalist free market direction. Now, the Communist Party always saw reforms as necessary steps in a planned path to building socialism, not simply to ameliorate the excesses of capital. But by the so-called wild 90s, the risk of moving in an actual capitalist reformist direction was uh, no longer a uh, unthinkable right there is a distinct possibility. And uh, here the party, uh, the uh, Chinese Communist Party had uh, studied not just the successes of the Soviet Union, but also what caused it to implode. In the following decade, uh, the early 2000s involved an intense effort on the part of the Communist Party, rooting out corruption from its ranks and refocusing adjustment out of the socialist market economy to stabilize the economy and the trajectory of socialist construction. Uh, they did achieve that balance and it, it was, that, was a, uh, that was a fairly rocky decade as well. And uh, they knew they had a long way to go and there is a long way to go yet. But for all that, uh, in 2020, China was the only major country to register positive growth with its gross domestic product hitting 15.75 trillion as it continues to rank it among the top world economies. Uh, Xi Jinping's macroeconomic emphasis has been key in addressing uh, the inequalities that have arisen during the last several decades of fast development, particularly in the rural areas. A uh, combination of market forces and highly disciplined planning by the Chinese government over the last decade enabled the government to embark on a very ambitious and successful poverty alleviation program, and it raised the standards of living of some several hundred millions of working people to what uh, we would compare to uh, middle class in the West. Uh, Z characterizes this socialist market economy as what he calls the two hands economy. The invisible hand is a reference to the 18th century economist Adam Smith regarding the market activity and the visible hand is a necessary hand of government oversight and strict regulation to temper behavior of private capital in accordance with China's, uh, China's laws and ensure that the public sector promotion of social fairness, justice, stability, and common prosperity are not encroached upon. Um, I'll just conclude by, this This needs an acknowledgement right there. I, we've gotten a bunch of thoughtful um, and valid questions from friends, associates, and comrades before, during this event too, regarding China's commitment to environment, labor rights, and uh, a whole host of other issues that are important topics. and. Uh, those are discussions I hope to have as this uh, carries on beyond uh, this event. But what I want to emphasize is that uh, in order for all this to work, the long-term project that China has been embarking on realizes its socialist development without the people at its center, is socialist is name, in name only. And the Chinese Communist Party are cognizant that their future ultimately depends on its success. And uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, staying with me. 
Thank you, Tobin. That was wonderful. So um, I'm actually going to put the timer on for 10 minutes and be cognizant of the amount of space to take up in the chat. And when you're speaking, um, actually, uh, Howard, I think we're going to roll back to your question because, or actually the billionaire question would be appropriate to, to respond to here if you want to answer that. So how does the Chinese government uh, keep control of of the billionaires and uh, outside a, a foreign foreign that was in his question it was somebody else's question the foreign influences and Howard had a general question about socialism so um, is it okay if we lead off with the first question and then Howard's question yeah yeah uh, that is an excellent question too uh, I know that uh, I can only answer really in a very general way the uh, a lot of the laws that govern it were uh, were uh, put in place um, and developed uh, before they had they developed anything like a uh, I think a billionaire class. Uh, that may that may be a factor, but that's speculation. I don't want to talk out of school. Um, I know that the uh, the uh, the consequences of uh, of overstepping are, are very strict. Uh, but uh, that that's something that uh, that would require a little bit uh, a bit more uh, study on my part. Like I said, this was a this was a vast topic right there. Perhaps uh, one of my comment one of my comrades might uh, might fill in whatever gaps that I have. Hey Sue. Yeah. Hey Sue. Go ahead. Go ahead, Wiley. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're right. It's a very complicated question in a way, but I think it's also a very straightforward answer to that question. Capitalism breeds billionaires. Capitalism is what it is. It's capitalist relationship. And that's what makes it dynamic. And that's what makes it produces billionaires as well as wealth. The critical point is, is that the billionaires do not function as a class. That the state, the, the, the Chinese state controls the political economy of China and the billionaires. And if you look at the press, and right now, the CP, the Central Committee, and the leading bodies are dealing with this question with the growth of these corporations, with their influence, not only uh, in terms of economics, but culturally in China. And they're kicking their ass, excuse me for the expression. They're making sure that they get the benefits of the capitalist relations of production but at the same time, control the bad side, the anti, the, the side that threatens the socialist construction. So it's no, I mean, everybody makes a big deal about big, big deal about the 285 billionaires in, in, in China, but they forget about the tremendous economic wealth generated by China as a result of these, these reform changes and the ability of the Chinese state to control these people. Look at the question of Jack Ma. They kicked his butt. And, and the other thing on it is, uh, I think we need to revisit the critique of the Gotha program where Marx talks about this tremendous struggle and recognizing that socialism is capitalism and the struggle for communism. It's a whole historical transitional period in which the proletariat will use every weapon available to it, including capitalism, to rapidly develop the productive force on behalf of the people. So I think we have to contextualize it. But uh, in my view, the presence of VAS at this point presents no threat to socialism in China. Now, can we predict the future? No. But so far, from, if we look at the record of what the CPC is doing now, what they're doing this very moment in terms of their meetings, we can have all confidence that socialism is in good hands in China. Interesting. Stephanie, were you going to speak to this question or ask another question? And you need to unmute. Yeah, actually, I was going to make a couple of points regarding this question. Go ahead. And that, and that was that one of the things that I found very instructive to look at was the Chinese anti-monopoly law regarding the platform industry. Now, while that industry is largely IT in, ter in terms of um, information in terms of sale of products, in terms of facilitating distribution, 
it's a very it's very uh, instructive because it probably applies to other industries as well. And this is something that we will want to study further. There are all kinds of strict regulations against monopolistic practices in the platform industry. Everything from cornering the market, from artificially raising prices to artificially lowering prices. Um, all of these things are very, very strictly regulated. And engaging in these practices by any IT industry uh, to, to the disadvantage of another IT industry is definitely promote in, in China today. Law is very strict. Also, China is, you know, they've made, as we've seen, they've made tremendous achievements in development, but they're still a developing country. And development economics is very much a trial and error type of thing, especially when it comes to raising people's standards of living. And one of the things that I think we learned from the experience of the Soviet Union is that the uh, is, is that the private sector was such a no-no there that it sort of had to sort of exist underground. And there was, because there was no room for it to help distribute and to innovate, there was a lot of problems. There were a lot of problems with market to uh, um, uh, farm to market, transportation of agricultural goods. And so while, while the jury is still out in terms of how much the private sector will contribute to national wealth in China, it seems to be doing a great deal in terms of contributing to raising the standard of living thus far. And so instead of sort of dogmatically criticizing China for allowing the private sector in where it's appropriate, we need to investigate and see what we can learn from it. Okay. Also, um, a third and final point is that one of the things I noticed is that there is a lot of room now for initiatives in Chinese agriculture. People can, uh, individual farmers have cultivated land that was fallow and unused and used it to raise all kinds of new crops. They have um, contracted leases with other farmers who are not using their land. Uh, and as they accumulate wealth, they have actually developed other side and cottage industries too. So, you know, it's a question of development economics. It's a question of um, how to use a tool and how, at the same time, since we're dealing with the private sector and with capitalist articulation, how to regulate it and make sure that it is the servant of economic development and not the master. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Howard, you have like two, two and a half minutes, and then we're going to go into the next speaker. Yeah, first of all, I want to really thank RNA for having this incredibly important discussion. I'd like to make a proposal. I'm not sure uh, who's the leadership here beside Wiley, who I've known uh, for about 35, 40 years. I think it would be really positive to have a series of discussions on this question because it's very hard to unpack everything, uh, particularly everything that's happened since 1978. Um, in one hour or two. Um, so I just want to speak uh, as someone who's been a supporter of the Chinese Revolution since 1965, uh, helping organize the first trip of medical students and doctors in 1972, um, having been in communication with members of the party, uh, mid-level and working members and peasant members of the parties to this day, um, and having visited China uh, for over a month, uh, two and a half years ago. I think what has to happen here, first, I just want to correct um, some things that may not have been said intentionally. Uh, life expectancy vastly increased the most between 1949 and 1978, not since 1978. You can look it up on the UN. Uh, secondly, what we have to look at is not just the overall um, economic increase in terms of people's uh, income, but we have to look at the question of class differentiation. One of the fundamentals of socialism is, is class differentiation increasing or decreasing um, as you know, the system of mixed economy uh, goes on? And clearly in China, by all indicators, class differentiation has been increasing. 
Uh, this is true in the most public fundamental sectors of society where free education, free healthcare, free social services disappeared starting in 1978 and completely gone since 1985. Um, the situation, for example, um, with what you saw in the COVID was that people do not have free access to primary healthcare uh, for the most part. What people have now that's been done uh, started before COVID and since COVID is to develop what's called a national health insurance program when they have to be hospitalized. That's improved tremendously since SARS-1, but in terms of access to free primary health care, that's out of reach for the vast majority of Chinese because of the cost. The same thing with education beyond ninth grade. Uh, finally, in terms of a, a really important discussion is the question of the Belt Road Initiative. The question before all of us, all of humanity, is that does the Belt and Road Initiative get us closer to dealing with climate change or take us further away? And the, the final thing I think that we all have agreement on is we have to differentiate the attacks by the US, EU, and Japanese imperialists on China and defend the people of China and the government of China against these attacks. But that does not mean that China is going down the socialist road the right way. Thank you. All right, Howard, thank you so much for those thoughtful criticisms and questions and uh, facts. Um, all right, very good. I think we can all agree that we're here to learn together, and this isn't going to be the only the only time that we have a discussion. Uh, uh, Bill has put a, um, a link to the next Chinese history or next Chinese film, but this will be a series of talks, right? Uh, okay, thank you. And I see you two people who've asked questions, but I do want the speakers to have time to present, and then we'll pick up these questions towards the end. So up next, we have Richard, who's going to speak about poverty alleviation, uh, the medical system, and COVID-19. And I wish Howard had stuck around, but he left. I guess I'm going to have to shoot the video to him later. All right, uh, Richard, take it away, my friend. Thank you, Hishu. <laughs> I wanted to say thanks for everybody for being here. I'm excited about talking about this subject and listening to uh, the questions and the responses. I'm going to go ahead now. The Opium Wars began in 1839 to 1842. The second Opium War was from 1856 to 1860. China lost both wars and was forced to relinquish the territory of Hong Kong to the British until 1997. China was occupied by Britain, US, and France, and during World War II, the Japanese, and it was only after the victory of the Chinese Revolution in 1949 ended 100 years of a humiliation. The opium trade was left its imprint on the older population. It is this, these experiences that still have persistent effect in China that the West is strong and that we are weak and poor and speechless. I'm gonna repeat this uh, here. President Xi, what is concerning is cultural confidence. It is more than philosophy or social science. Cultural confidence is expressed in the material, spiritual, systemic life and values as a whole. China has a 5,000 year history. It is, the, it is this long history in self-belief that is the issue. Human rights in China is in Marxist materialism a social economic be benefit to the community. To do that, productive forces have to be liberated. Human rights is the right to a house, medical care, food, education, and a way to achieve human rights. Z has said many times, it is the objective of the Communist Party of China to build a moderately prosperous society. I will say here that it has been mentioned that this is a process um, and it's a process of development and figuring it out and making mistakes and making and having uh, successes. So I just want to make that, uh, I just wanted to say that. China has a population of 1.4 billion people. In order to move forward, the productive forces have to be liberated. This is a national project with millions of people participating and building cultural confidence. I think, uh, um, okay, extreme poverty alleviation. The development of production in China is the creation of the workers, peasants, government, and the CPC. 
in the last 30 years, the Chinese people and the Communist Party have alleviated extreme poverty and can show at all economic levels improvement, lifting over 800 million people out of extreme poverty. The most impoverished areas are targeted for the improvement of housing, healthcare, and other human rights. It is the workers themselves, with the cooperation of the government and the CPC, developing and planning what resources are available and how they can be used for production and improvement of the community. It is an effort of the entire country. Healthcare is a human right. That means that everyone has access to a doctor in rural areas and in urban areas. Basic medical insurance administered by the government. Basic medical insurance serves three groups. That is the employed workers, EBMI, with formal jobs, um, the urban residential uh, people, uh, BMI for residents without formal jobs, including children, the elderly, and self-employed. There is the newly cooperate, cooperative medical scheme offered to rural residents in 2003. Since 2020, there are about 1.35 billion people enrolled in one of these programs. That is about 95% of the population. There is a commercial health, health insurance, charitable donations, mutual aid activities, supplementary services. All big cities in China have hospitals that are specialized in different medical areas with modern equipment. The best care can be found in public city level hospitals and smaller district clinics. In rural areas, historically, Healthcare has been provide, providing basic care. There are rural area hospitals that have far better care in terms of equipment and staff. In different areas, when people are not able to travel to a family doctor, a family doctor will travel to the home of the patient. COVID-19, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there were some deaths in China in 2021. China is adhering to its dynamic zero COVID-19 approach. That is the policy of China to contain and eliminate COVID-19. When COVID-19, out, out, there is an outbreak, our, when COVID-19 outbreaks are discovered, local officials take action immediately to find the source of the infection contact tracing, closed off management, travel restrictions, vaccines, quarantine, and nucleic acid testing. Gao Yangheng from the National Health Commission said that China has the ability to test 30 million people a day compared to 16 million a year ago. New tests have been developed that can provide results in four minutes. About the pandemic, there have been about 16,000 deaths attributed to COVID-19 in China. China has administered about 4 billion vaccines in China. 6.5 million people in China have received boosters or additional doses. China has supplied 2 billion doses to 120 countries around the world and 372 billion masks. In the US, there has been almost a million deaths. The, the, the death toll in the US has fallen to a low of about 340 a day. By contrast, the cumulative death in China since Omicron BA2 invaded the country from overseas uh, uh, March is 287. During the COVID, during the same period, thousands of Americans have lost their lives from COVID-19 many more times as China. In conclusion, China has accompanied, has accomplished since 1949, many social and economic advancements. 
China is organized to plan and carry out projects of enormous size, lifting 800 million people out of extreme poverty, allows the people to be part of planning their future and building it in a cooperative and non-antagonistic way. China is outperforming all countries economically, in consumer goods, and in scientific development. Thank you. Richard, thank you so much. Um, so we again have 10 minutes to, to talk about these issues. And um, I know we have some questions on stack, but not, they're not necessarily related to COVID. Um, does anybody have any questions around COVID or healthcare? Uh, I know Howard raised the, the idea that, you know, there's no socialized healthcare in China, but you're obviously proving the opposite. So well, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I think, it's, I don't know. I don't know if you could respond to that, even though he's not. <laughs> uh, uh, do you want me to respond to that? I, I think so, because here again, we're, we're, we're speaking uh, facts versus. Yeah. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I think that, uh, well, it, I said that there were 95% people covered by the three programs, and uh, those programs are in effect. They're not in effect on an equal basis. There may be some inequalities. Well, the system catches up with especially the rural populations, but they're being, uh, they are, are uh, not being neglected as far as I as far as I know, I, th I think that the system is trying to improve the medical uh, care for everybody. And like, I, like what I said, uh, China is building and is serious about building a moderately prosperous society for everyone. Um, maybe someone else, maybe Corallo, would you like to say something on this question? You have to unmute, comrade. Uh, thanks, uh, Richard. Uh, I'm I'm uh, lucky. I joined this China group uh, study group. I uh, study uh, that made me really uh, look back what I had experienced in China uh, uh, before I came to US. And uh, from the books you choosing, uh, I learned a lot. And uh, about uh, uh, about achievements in the uh, health field in China, I think the data uh, Richard just quoted there uh, shows a great uh, improvement. Think about in nine, 1949, the life expectation for normal Chinese was 43 years old, 43 years old. And this year, it's better than people in US. It's uh, over 77 years old, uh, years for the life expectation. That's for the, you know, whole, population, 1.4 billion people. So we could not just say there, yeah, you know, people in the remote region are still only suffering, not changed. There's a big change there. I went to the countryside for three years during the Cultural Revolution. So I had, uh, I, I have uh, some friends in the countryside. Uh, one of my friends uh, uh, had uh, a very uh, serious uh, uh, illness, a blood cancer, called blood cancer. And he had a blood cancer, he had to take um, a huge um, uh, treatment constantly. And uh, he was so happy uh, telling me that uh, he was able to get a reimbursement for over 85% uh, of the cost of his treatment. He's just a peasant in the countryside. So that, uh, that's the, the fact is even the parents in the countryside today uh, the can, uh, can get helps from the system 
and to get it reimbursed if they have serious yearlies, if they have to uh, pay for big medical bills. And also, um, I found when we are, we are studying the, the books and uh, looking back, uh, I found that there is a gap, huge gap uh, between the facts and uh, the media stories here. And in China, there's so many things happen and uh, uh, people are working, 1.4 billion people working every day. They make changes so quickly. Uh, when we are talking about how long the highways has been built, they're just already there. It's not a, just a, a plan. And uh, look at, uh, you know, I'm in Detroit. We have a highway 75 from downtown down to, uh, to Toledo. And a, a, a short part of it has been blocked for, for years, even today, still there. And that blocked the traffic for so long. <laughs> And, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, we are still talking about how slow the Chinese were. That's a, that's a problem of how, um, you know, our media, uh, the news agencies, how the, they are really doing their job. Uh, you know, people like me came from China who had uh, experiences of uh, what uh, called a cultural revolution. I was uh, bothered about it, why that could happen, you know, cultural revolution. We only heard about uh, uh, stories. Later on, we found that was not true. But here, uh, sadly, I saw something similar I, I don't know how we can, uh, you know, categorize th this year or these years in U.S. Later, I would like to call it a U.S. culture <laughs> revolution. <laughs> it's a disaster. You know, when you block the, the truth, just uh, think of, uh, by yourself, uh, that's a disaster. But uh, of course, Nowhere in the world can be perfect. You know, when we are human beings, uh, there's always different people. When you have 1.4 billion people, you cannot expect everybody uh, the same. There must be bad people and extremists, extreme people, strange people. There can be all, all kinds. So, uh, as, uh, of course, there's a, a lot of people who are, say, uh, uh, unsatisfied. That's nature. Uh, and uh, uh, the most important is, is that country are, are caring itself. Mm -hmm. The people are getting better. The same like us, you know, in US, we have just uh, uh, how many people? 300 million people. Like a family, if you only have three people in your family, you are just saying another family has 12 people. Mm -hmm. And you criticize them, you criticize it. <laughs> That's not fair. Yeah. You know, uh, they have more people, they have more problems, surely. And uh, every country, uh, if they are focused on improving, that will be uh, good. That's, uh, uh, I, when I, uh, I go back to study, I remember about this. And I am so glad, you know, uh, to fail. Uh, there's a lead to study about China and the study from facts and uh, seeking the truth. Yep. Uh, which, sorry, I took a long time. No, no, no, I think that's beautiful. And you know, if you wanna talk about improvements, okay, the, the life expectancy of black and brown people has declined since COVID. I, you know, that, that's it, it's what it is. And come on, almost 1 million people have died in this country 
because of the way they manage COVID, the way they, they, they misinform people on purpose, the way they distribute a vaccine in such a racist way. I call it, I call it genocide, call it what it is. You know? And then, then to even that, come on, you know what used to really piss me off and I'll tell this, that uh, when the numbers would come out about how many people were being vaccinated by the Chinese, oh, the Chinese vaccine isn't as effective. You know, it's not as effective, right? It doesn't create as many antibodies. And I'm thinking, you know, if it's not effective and it's not creating as many antibodies, then why aren't people dying? Come on now, you know? And so I just find that, I'm sorry, I, I get upset about these things because anytime there's any project that's remotely socialist, the American media just crushes it, right? And you tell a lie enough times and people believe it. And that's a problem. So uh, I see Yolanda's on stack. Yolanda, as you, I'm assuming you're speaking about this, right? You have to unmute, sister. You're muted still. Yeah, I wanted to talk about two things, the books and how much crime there is in China, because I know in the United States, I'm a communist, not a socialist, but I appreciate socialism. I know in the United States, there's a lot of crime, and I think it's because due to capitalism. And I think as long as there's capitalism in the United States, there's going to be crime and drug addiction. I think when the first guy talked to you and he talked about the government in China, that's the main difference. But uh, uh, I wholeheartedly believe in, in, in, in the hopefully eradicating capitalism. And the other thing is that I know that when I was in Chicago, we had a, there was, we had access to three books. I think they were published while Mao Zedong was alive. We just price and profit and value, some surplus that, something like that. And they're very good books. They were one dollar. They were pocket books. I was wondering if they still published those because I would sure buy some and distribute them. Those are great books. They were like capital but condensed, and and they were small pocket books and easy to understand. So. I, I, if somebody could talk about how, if there's any crime or drug addiction, and I know it took the communist revolution in China to get rid of the opioid addiction that they had in China. So your question so, has to do with crime rates and drug addiction, is that correct? Yes, and okay. also if those three books are still being published and can we get access to them? Okay, so you're, ask, you're asking if we can get access to free, free books from China that have to do no, with three, three books. Three books. Okay, very good. So uh, what are the crime rates in China, especially around drug addiction? And can we get access to free books about China? Three books about greatest price. It was about capital, but it was in condensed form. They were little bit books with picture and mouth. And one of them was called Wages, Prices, and Profit. How oh, okay. capitalists accumulate the profits from our labor exploitation. There were three different books with three different titles. One of them was Prices. And, and there was another one. And, and I know I haven't seen them. They used to come from China. They were only a dollar each. All right. Thank you. If anybody knows, we can get access to those books. Okay. Thank right. you. Excellent. Thank you, Lana. Those are very thoughtful questions. Okay. Who wants to take the question on crime? I, I have no idea of uh, a crime in China. I have not gotten into that. Uh, if anybody else knows anything about crime in China and can talk about it. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm following Richard. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the collective did <laughs> is, is sort of restricted, particularly for a person like me, is we go from facts. <laughs> We're seeking truth for facts. And the unfortunate fact is we did not address the specific area of crime in China. So unless Dave has, or unless Tobin has read, or Stephanie has read something mm -hmm. you know, on their own, we've never treated that subject. It is a subject that we certainly should deal with and will, but right. we haven't done it. So we don't want to get in no speculation here. It no, isn't. that's right. But Dave, Dave has his hand up. It seems like he knows something. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Uh, Dave, you got to mute, brother. You're muted. Yes. Oh, okay. I think Kerala would be the best person, yeah. if anyone, to answer that. We didn't, as as uh, Wiley said, we did not study that question. And, and that's Kerala really may know something. Fine, comrades, you know, maybe this is a question that we can just put on the little uh, you, you yeah, and we'll save yeah, it for another panel discussion. 
I, I think uh, we, we can answer this way. Anyone in the audience uh, uh, has visited China in the recent years? They can tell. Yeah. <laughs> China, as me, I traveled uh, uh, around the world, many, uh, many, many countries. And uh, I can say China can be the one of the safest, safest country in the world, safer than US and safer than in many, many other countries like uh, Mexico, Europe. That's, uh, that's a fact. You, you know, there's, there is numbers uh, anywhere. But if you are a foreigner, if you travel to, to China, you will not have problem of your safety. That's kind of different than you are traveling even in New York. Yeah, my nephew actually went to China recently. I think it was last December. And uh, one, he was incredibly, um, one, the COVID safety impressed him to no end. But he also said he was walking around at two in the morning, you know, <laughs> and having a, a just, you know, a, you can't do that in Chicago. You can't do that in Detroit, I, I'm sure. But Rosemary, just to close this out, we only have two minutes left. Go ahead and ask your question. And if we can't address it now, we'll address it at the end. Oh, it was a, um, a point of information. I was just want, I thought someone was going to speak on the Belt and Road Initiative, and I was wondering if it was another panelist. And then I had a question about uh, within the context of um, global capitalism and China switching to um, central bank um, digital currencies. Uh, uh, All right. Uh, that, uh, hey, Sue? Yes. So I'd like the second one answered. Yeah, we're going to deal with that in Belton Road. Okay, probably yeah. towards the end. But yeah, somebody chatted out that they're going to cover it. Um, okay, so then about the um, uh, digital currency, central bank digital currency within the context of um, the global capitalist system that's we're all involved, <laughs> enmeshed in. So I guess if I could unpack that question, how how is uh, the di digital currency playing a part in the global market or what's the impact been on the Chinese economy or like- how um, Where does China stand on that? There you go. Where does China That's stand? The That's the direction that is being proposed within the global- All right, thank you. Uh, hey, Sue? Yes. Again, uh, I was gonna to touch upon that in a comment. All right, I tell you what, comrades, since this up, how about you're up next? Let's, let's put your conversation up next. Uh, Wiley is going to uh, be speaking about the Belt and Road Initiative, and we're actually going to play a video with a, a voiceover um, just to to uh, to um, accommodate our, our comrades. So here we go. Yeah, no, no, hold, hold it. Hold no? it. Yeah, let me let me sort of comment. Oh, let sure. Me explain why uh, we did the video. Uh, I have uh, we did the first because I'm going to do a couple of analysis. I want to certainly. I uh, express my appreciation to Rand for working with me on the difficult situations. I'm having a difficult recovery from a difficult recovery from retina surgery, and I can't see a damn thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Rand, I tried to, the, the collective wanted me to put my voice from the presentation. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't see good enough uh, to read the text and create an audio file. And so Rand was put under great pressure at the last moment to produce this video. So my thanks to him. I also want to give a shout out to Lerna uh, for this very important service they're providing with these, these videos. Uh, I looked at others and it's, it's, it's remarkable. So I, I just have to acknowledge that and my own sense of privilege of being a part of it, I hope to make the contribution. So now you can roll it. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm just um, putting a few comments in there, if you could pay attention to those. All right, very good. Thank you, Wiley. Thank you for that. Shout out to our comrade, Rand, who did do a really, really, uh, this is not easy work. Let's just put it that way, All right, Here we go. Names to provide. Well, let me rewind I apologize, here we go. <clears throat> Aims of the presentation. This presentation aims to provide a brief description of China's Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, its origins, structure, and purpose, 
evidence for the proposition that the BRI is concretely socialist construction with Chinese characteristics, some thoughts on the relevance of the BRI to the U.S. revolutionary movement. The presentation is limited by time and my rudimentary knowledge of this important subject. <clears throat> the hope is that enough content is supplied to stimulate discussion and further inquiry. Origin of the BRI In a speech in Kazakhstan on September 2013, China's President Xi Jinping proposed to forge closer economic ties, deepen cooperation and expand development space in the Eurasian region. We should take an innovative approach and jointly build an economic belt along the Silk Road. Less than a month later in October 2013, in a speech in Indonesia, Zai stated, Southeast Asia has since ancient times been an important hub along the ancient maritime Silk Road. China will strengthen maritime cooperation with ASEAN countries to make good use of the China and ASEAN Maritime Cooperation Fund set up by the Chinese government and vigorously develop maritime partnership in a joint effort to build the maritime Silk Road of the 21st century. In these two speeches I set in place the cornerstones of the BRI, the Economic Belt and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road. Structure of BRI Economic Corridors The belt in the BRI consists of the following six land economic corridors. 1. China-Mongolia-Russia Economic Corridor 2. New Eurasian Land Bridge Economic Corridor 3. China-Central Asia-West Asia Economic Corridor 4. China-Pakistan Economic Corridor 5. Bangladesh-China-India-Myanmar Economic Corridor 6. China Indochina Peninsula Economic Corridors These six economic corridors link to comprise the Silk Road Economic Belt integrating China with Central, South, and Southeast Asia and Russia to form an interconnected economic area. See Figure 1. Figure 2 provides a schematic of the Maritime Silk Road. Structure of the BRI Maritime Component The road component of the BRI is the 21st century maritime Silk Road consisting of a series of sea routes and ports linking up Asia, Europe, and Africa. Following is a partial list of ever-expanding routes. China-Southeast Asia Route China-South Asia Route China-Middle East and Africa Route China-European Route Structure of the BRI, Member Countries From approximately 10 countries in Central Asia in 2014, the BRI has rapidly expanded beyond this region to global dimensions. As of March 2021, 139 countries and 32 international organizations were BRI members including Latin America and Caribbean 19 countries Sub-Saharan Africa, 39 countries Middle East and North Africa, 17 countries. Europe and Central Asia, 34 countries. East Asia and the Pacific, 25 countries. South Asia, 6 countries. Figure 3 provides a schematic of the distribution of BRI member countries around the globe. Functions of the BRI the number and variety of projects and activities undertaken by BRI challenges comprehension. They can be categorized into the following areas, infrastructure, production facilities, transport, energy, communications, etc. Transportation, connectivity and networking of land, sea, air, space. Construction, commercial, residential, government, smart cities. Communications Broadband, Fiber Optic, Telecommunications, Healthcare Delivery, Data Governance and Security. Energy and Power, Green, Oil and Gas Pipeline, Power Plant, Wind Farms, Nuclear, Electrical Grid. Innovation, Artificial Intelligence, AI, Drone and Robotics, Nanotechnology, Quantum Computing, Bioinformatics, Ecological Science, STEM Educational Exchange. Cultural, Tourism, Educational and Artistic Exchange, and Collaboration. Unfortunately, 
time and space does not permit the presenting of examples of the cutting-edge projects the BRI provides to participating countries such as state-of-the-art high-speed railways, or the provision of 5 grams broadband services to thousands of African villages. Such information is readily available at the website of the Belt and Road Forum. Aims and Purposes of the BRI all the projects and activities initiated by the BRI are aimed at the achievement of the following objectives or priorities. Policy coordination, government to government. Infrastructure connectivity country to country, region to region. Unimpeded trade, free trade zones, mutually beneficial exchange. Financial integration, currency stabilization, de-dollarization. People to people communication cultural scientific, and educational exchange. What emerges from the above is the striving for cooperation, connectivity, and innovation among all countries in all areas essential to the satisfaction of human needs. At the first Belt and Road Forum, BRF, in 2017 President Tsai stated, We should foster a new type of international relations featuring win-win cooperation, and we should forge partnerships of dialogue with no confrontation and of friendship rather than alliance. At the second BRF in May 2019s I emphasized the importance of innovation. Innovation boosts productivity, it makes companies competitive and countries strong. We need to keep up with the trend of the fourth industrial revolution, jointly seize opportunities created by digital, networked, and smart development explore new technologies and new forms and models of business, foster new growth drivers and explore new development pathways, and build the digital Silk Road and the Silk Road of innovation. The BRI's Construction of Socialism The following passage from the Communist Manifesto contextualizes the role of the BRI as China's contribution to the construction of socialism on a global scale. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to wrest, by degree, all capital from the bourgeoisie, to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state, i.e., of the proletarian organized as the ruling class, and to increase the total productive forces as rapidly as possible. My emphasis WR. With a CPC membership over 92 million and popular approval of government and party exceeding 90% it is evident that state power is firmly in the hands of the proletariat. Further, it is also evident that the historic improvements in all important measures of satisfaction of human development and needs, life expectancy, material well-being, poverty and illiteracy elimination, etc., is impossible without the all-round development of the productive forces, a task the CPC is given primacy throughout the whole period of the existence of the PRC. Finally, it is apparent that with the BRI this commitment and practice to the well-being of humankind is extended to the international arena. Relevance of the BRI for the U.S. Revolutionary Movement To grasp the full significance of the BRI, Indeed the astonishing accomplishments of the Chinese people and the CPC one must as Deng Xiaoping would say liberate thought, or, as Chairman Mao Zedong would advise to wash one's brains. <laughs> Importantly, one must be conscious of and resist the tendency to view China through Western eyes. The vast, malevolent propaganda apparatus of U.S. capitalism has effectively transformed the undeniable facts of China's achievements into a terrifying horror narrative that holds the U.S. masses in thrall. In 2020 63% of Americans viewed China's economic power as a critical threat up from 40% in 2018. 67% had negative views on China versus 46% in 2018. The Chinese openly acknowledged the effectiveness of the propaganda war waged by the U.S. against them. They are mounting a counter-offensive against what they call historical nihilism. Xu Qingshan, head of the Party History Research Office of the CPC Central Committee defines the essence of historical nihilism as political thoughts with strong political tendencies and intentions. Such thoughts seek to distort the history of modern China's revolution the CPC and the armed forces under the guise of re-evaluation. Chu provides the following advice to cadres. 
One key weapon against historical nihilism is to stick to historical materialism and always seek truth from facts. Combat historical nihilism. Revolutionaries should heed Chu's advice. An all-out war must be declared and fought against historical nihilism. But to be successful in this war we must have concrete knowledge of the enemy, the forms it assumes, the uniforms it dons. We must do battle with historical nihilism with U.S. characteristics. Roland Bohr in his book Socialism with Chinese Characteristics, A Foreigner's Guide provides a helpful typology of historical nihilism in U.S. garb. A brief description of this typology is given below. 1. Secular Apocalypse, The Inevitable Collapse of Godless Communism 2. Dystopian Fiction, Surveillance State Genocide in Tibet, Atrocity Propaganda 3. Ghost Story, CPC Secretly Seeking World Domination, China's Clandestine Quest for Hegemony 4. Conspiracy Theory, Capitalist Rotterdang Overthrows Revolutionary Mao A favorite of some Western Marxists 5. Orientalist Mystery, Racist Trope of the Yellow Peril Chinks, Intellectual Property Piracy 6. Sectarian Intolerance, Disease of Western Marxists, My Way or the Highway, Socialism Without Capitalism All the above and more are various expressions of the pernicious ideology of white supremacy, the principal weapon of U.S. capitalism in its fight to maintain our class in a divided and benighted state. Our task is to educate our class on this fact. Conclusion From a Strategic an historical perspective the BRI can be understood as the emergence of a qualitatively new approach to global human and societal development. The BRI expresses the transition from the 500-year reign of a system of international relations based on conquest, domination, and plunder to one that is grounded in the principles and practice of mutual benefit and respect and peace. It is the epoch of the transition from a dominant strategic vision of zero sum of win-lose to one of shared benefits of common destiny, of win-win. In conclusion, the BRI is not an expression of bourgeois philanthropy or a neo-imperialist quest for world hegemony. The BRI is simply China's recognition that its fate as a country and a civilization is inextricably bound up with that of humanity and the planet. The BRI is China's commitment to the preservation and improvement of both. Uh, that's okay. it, folks. Okay. I just a couple of clarifying comments. Uh, first, uh, because the, the machine gave the voice and made a few mistakes. One, when it said five grams, you know, it really meant 5G, uh, five China as part of BI is building a 5G network to serve thousands of African villages. The other thing that is problematic is that uh, it's difficult for the machine to, uh, the computer to distinguish between categories and examples. So that, that wasn't clear. So I just want to make those couple of observations. Uh, and one last thing uh, to emphasize uh, and not, is, is Howard here or is he, is he gone? He's still gone. He had left. Yeah. Well, See, Howard, I want to, Howard's situation, and I don't like to criticize people in their absence, but it's a classic example of what, we, what the Chinese call historical nihilism, or, or, or seeing China through Western eyes. I mean, he's just the victim, and like many of us are, uh, to being immersed and embedded in this, you know, it dehumanizing ideology of white supremacy and, and, and dominates it. So uh, it's, it's like what Mao and others said, it's a question of re-education and remolding. And we just have to, that's what we're about. So thank you for tolerating <laughs> that, that mechanical presentation. No, it's great. All right, so we have 10 minutes to, to ask uh, how, um, uh, widely questions on, on this, if anybody has any comments or questions on this particular topic. David? I just want to compliment Wyler. That was a fabulous presentation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you addressed so many questions, so many issues. 
and it really does explain uh, uh, BRI and proletarian internationalism. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just want, uh, Jesus, can I answer a question that uh, I once probably asked, asked earlier? Sure. Um, uh, the question was asked about cryptocurrency uh, and China's role on that. Um, a couple of things I couldn't mention in the presentation. Uh, there, there is a definite war uh, contest, not by China's choosing, but China's recognition of what's had happened between the uh, whole internet, the dominance of the international currency regime by the United uh, States imperialism. And they've developed, uh, uh, along with the BRI, uh, certain entities which engage in pro process of de-dollarization, that is getting rid of the dollar as an international reserve currency in you know, certain economic spheres. One of these is what's called the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, which is uh, billions of dollars, and, and it, along with the Silk Road Fund, uh, funds and otherwise many of the BII projects by providing loans and grants and so forth. The cryptocurrency is something that's developed by the Bank of China, the People's Bank of China. Uh, and what that is, and, and you got to put it in context, that before I say that, the first thing we have to understand that China leads the world in the development and science of digital technology. And they have developed a protocol, uh, a crypto protocol, which is virtually unhackable. That is, nobody can get into it. And they use this as a basis for developing currencies, a crypto, cryptocurrency and internet currency exchange, everything. So, you know, it, it's, it's the kind of thing where you do all your money time transactions on your phone and in the you know in, in the cloud so to speak and it's completely secure can't can't do anything with it and under this regime under this protocol uh the people's bank of china is developing uh crypt this this crypto this legitimate cryptocurrency and this is a game changer uh and, and china has control of it uh in, in terms of the ability in this scaring the hell out of the United States and other places because once this is properly put in place, that's the end for them in terms of the dynamics and the domination of the financial sphere. All right, thank you. I have Ren on stack and I think Rosemary's back on stack. Ren, go ahead. Yes, and if we were to watch the recent events in uh, Eastern Europe and the use of economic uh, sanctions, against uh, the enemy or the people that they want to compete with in the market. In Russia, this case has to do with oil in Europe to a large degree. The use of the SWIFT banking system to yeah, deny yeah. them the ability to transfer money to not only pay their bills, but to buy resources. Well, China has been fighting that totally in context with the Bridges and Road Initiative or Belts and Roads, because it's to the advantage of the international banking system to prevent them from paying bills and yeah. or buying resources outside right. their system. Mm -hmm. So this is really a revolutionary act as well as that we're going to see the effect of cryptocurrency, which has gotten a bad name, uh, replace the dollar. Yeah, um, much like uh, the petrodollar had replaced the uh, the dollar standard, this is new technology. It's the future. Yeah. So uh, Yolanda has a um, a comment. She says, uh, "I was at a FMLN uh, cheese press Zoom, uh, El Salvadorans in America and El Salvador. One dude from the Bay Area said crypto only currency allowed in El Salvador, and when he sends money to El Salvador from here, they in El Salvador." Uh, the bank take his money for themselves to crypto. I, I think that's just banks in general, but I guess, we, are you asking if crypto allows for banks to take money more readily? 
Um, I'm just stating something. He said, I myself am against crypto. Uh, I'm an old fashioned, I'm 71 years old. Uh, I like human contact. Um, I don't know. I, I, I thought, I didn't know it was China initiator. I thought it was European or um, tied in with the dollars. So, um, uh, like I say, I'm a communist, not a socialist, but I do appreciate the socialist. And um, in, in the United States, according to the pamphlet by know from Perry Brook Haggerty, moving on from racial division to class unity, capitalism was built on slavery. In the United States, to me, that's always going to translate to black and black crime, drug addiction, um you know um a lot of a lot of stuff that's african americans are always going to be victimized uh i see it as a process socialism but it can work in china it can work maybe in africa but i know a comrade once said that the tornadoes the hurricane in the United states are coming from the coast of africa that's where the, the heat starts and it comes away to this country. So uh, I'm not against China. I know he was trying to make changes and then he just changed and then in that point where he said he didn't want to be sanctioned by by uh, Biden. So he went to back to supporting more corporate interests. And um, uh, I know that the United States is threatened by Russian China economy, and I'm going to oppose China um, war by initiated by the United States. And I think that's why we do have to talk about socialism and communism. I just want to for myself that the communists are taking our job and we're going to go to war against China. I, I was unaware of the rising percentage of people are turning against China. I don't know if it was due to Trump to the virus misinformation. Um, and I talked to people and um, I would still like to know those there's three, one, two, three books are available because the United States, it's got a different origins and history than China and the conditions are different. Right. I think uh, Lou said that the books were as readily available as they were before. So maybe oh, okay. just a question searching for them. Uh, Rosemary, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed you. Uh, are you back on staff? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I was going to, I wanted clarification, not on cryptocurrency, but on digital, central bank digital, which would take us off the dollar. Yeah. And uh, China did get rid of this uh, crypto. If possible, I would like to ask Steve Miller if he could explain it a little more because he's pretty much on top of it. But I don't know if time permits for that. Yeah, we're at, uh, I think your 412, which is my 312. Um, we can start going into the, the general questions and answer session, but Steve, can you speak to that? And then I see Peter's on stack and Joyce was in stack from before. And if your question wasn't answered, please, please go ahead and restack. Uh, P, P, uh, go ahead, Steve. Um, <clears throat> I put the, my response in chat before Rosemary asked it. Uh, <clears throat> my understanding is that crypto is decentralized. And in order to make it a uh, precious asset, it's very much restricted. Therefore, you have to do all these calculations which absorb massive amounts of energy. Uh, a year ago, China was the world's crypto farm where more people did crypto than anywhere else. They got rid of that as part of their uh, moves and they made a number of moves against foreign capitalism trying to penetrate uh, China. Now it seems that Nebraska is where crypto is mined at more than anywhere else. Um, but central bank digital currencies are centralized. The, these guys, the crypto guys, uh, stole the technological leap on the central banks, but they said, wait a minute, we're not going to give up our power. Uh, and we're not just talking about China, we're talking about all the central banks. They don't want decentralized uh, currency. So uh, it's still in investigation, and I think it's an inevitability. The interesting thing is that if, if they can have central bank digital currencies, why have money at all? Yeah, right. 
you know, I mean, just give us the power to click on our phones and, you know, buy the commodities. It's just the same thing. Straight up. That this, this, oh my gosh, we're going to have to have a whole other session on all this because I'm having a bulk and mind melt. I'm like, what? Okay, uh, we're going to roll back to, uh, Peter, were you going to ask a question? I, we're, we're out of time for this unit, but we can just open up to for general questions. Peter, did you have a question about uh, digital currency or cryptocurrency? Well, it's related to that, but if Joyce, Joyce has been on longer. Yeah, so. Joyce, Joyce had a really profound question, Joyce. I don't know if you want to restate it or you want me to go back to the comments and reread it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so much has gone on in the discussion since I asked it, but um, I guess what I would suggest is that um, I'd like to hear more about what, I mean, I really appreciate the inquiry that this study group has done. And I appreciate that I don't know much, uh, uh, as much as they do um, about China, but I am interested in this question of what classes we're talking about from the standpoint of how China looks at it and from the standpoint of your study, um, if, if, the, if they see the political apparatuses really being a united front between different classes, then, they're, then they do see some, some sense of classes. I think, I don't wanna to get too theoretical about it, but I think that these questions, obviously the anti-China uh, context within which we're studying this in the United States or any country really, um, makes it very difficult. And I'm you know, not uh, uh, interested in attacking China when I don't know almost anything about it. So, uh, that's not where I'm coming from, but I am interested um, as somebody who's a revolutionary in this country and who's looking at a global creation of a class under capitalist conditions, under private property conditions, what we've learned, what you might have learned about your study in China that might give us some indication about not just how it's having to compromise whatever it needs to do to, to build and get out of being a third world country, whatever you're saying, um, you know, a developing country, um, all of that makes, you know, I totally understand that. But it, so if you could get a little bit more into the class questions specifically, not just income and, in, you know, increased capacity and those things, which I do, I think I understand. And you had also raised uh, the question of the new class, how that plays into the, the analysis yeah. as well. Yeah, thank you, Joyce. That's a great question. Uh, hey, sir. Wiley. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you how I argued in the collective to approach it. The only thing the collective has always done is try to look at this question of China and its revolutionary process from the standpoint of China and its works. And the question that you raised, George, is spoken to very clearly by the Chinese. In particular, I can name two works. Um, the, and and, and I, I say this because what was said then has been the consistent revolutionary policy from that point forward, even up to the day on the class question. Um, Mao Zedong in the first one on all new democracy, in 1940, and again in 1949, and on the People's Democratic Dis Dictatorship, clearly stated what they saw in the various stages of the revolution as the class relations. And it was always in terms of the, the, the, the, the they mentioned these categories, the peasants, the urban proletariat, the urban workers, and the national bourgeoisie, uh, that is those, that element of the bourgeois class that was opposed to the Japanese capital in their country. And that's what, when they talked about United Front, that's what they were talking about. Uh, I have read nothing myself and I've seen nothing in their documentation that says anything different from that time, i.e that they still see themselves in two ways. First, 
As they describe themselves between the class struggle, they still see themselves as the primary stage of socialism. They still mm -hmm. acknowledge the class struggle. Uh, and the way they express it is, is the development of productive forces to lift the standards of all the people in the country. They acknowledge, for example, the uneven development within China in terms of the hinterlands, the southern and western provinces versus the coast. So they acknowledge it. I think the difference is, is that they do not talk about it in these categorical terms that we're used to. You know, we sort of put them in a box kind of thing. They recognize it more as a fluid situation, something like what Lenin said when he made the distinction between that it was relatively easy to overthrow the government. It's a damn hard site, much more, it's missing more difficult to construct socialism in terms of the kind of things they engage in. So that is certainly a question uh, that we need to look more closely at and we will be looking more closely in the collective, but I don't think it's any doubt uh, that what was established by those two works, and if you read them closely, I think you'll see what I'm saying, that that continues to this day to be their class policy. And, and just to add on another thing uh, that I think was clear from your presentations is that China is looking at the survival of the rest of the world, not just society. And that to me, okay, I'm sorry, I, I hate to, I'm not a presenter, but look, look at the way that American capitalism spreads and destroys the environment and exploits people and prevents other countries from participating, participating in the global market. It's a completely different narrative than I'm going to uplift my brothers and sisters in Latin America and other parts of the world providing Wi-Fi or what have you. It's just, it's just I still struggle with this to, to, because to me, corporations are evil, right? And, and billionaires are evil, but it's just a, just, just a different paradigm. Or I, I mean, I don't even know if that's the right terminology. It's just just different, way way different, and requires a lot more study on not just myself's part, but I think you know everybody's part. Uh, Peter, go ahead. Mm. Well, um, my my question is going to be one that we're going to have to take up at a further time. Uh, first, I want to thank the comrade for organizing this. This has been very rich and and very good for me, and I really appreciate the discussion and the effort. Uh, great presentations. Um, what what the especially the first two presentations, governance and the market economy, uh, make clear, and and uh, what Steve's illustration of the difference between a central digital currency and a cryptocurrency make clear is that we are no longer in the old economy. We are in a new economy that is in which the growing the the the growing aspect is a a globally interconnected and and interwoven inextricably interwoven network of capitals not nations and while there are still national and and multinational trading blocks and military blocks competing with each other they're competing with the, with each other in the context of that global interweaving and we have uh, if we if we do what Wiley says and not put try and put countries in in little cubby holes, then we take the label off of socialism and talk about what countries are actually trying to do. Try, China is an actual country right. of real people with a real government that's trying to and has been very successful at not only surviving but building socialist relations and human health and survival within the context of this global market economy. They have to exist in that, and they've done so very realistically. They're not alone. Cuba, Russia, the Soviet Union worked at that and ultimately failed. Hell, they thought they, they, they were, uh, Lenin was glad they existed six months. Uh, <laughs> Venezuela is another country that's tried to do that, to use global market economics to benefit their people. And of course, they've been slapped down. I, I, so I think we have to really discuss our role as revolutionaries, not in becoming, and, and I don't think anyone is here is supporting this, I, not in becoming simply supporters of a nation, right, right. but rather uh, our role in, in dismantling private property because we're not in the middle of capitalist development. We're at the very end when, when you have these networks that are so divorced 
from any real economy of real people and real needs that that all they do is make side bets on what's going to go up and and going to go down and then they try and engineer those things going up and down so i'll stop there i don't want to run on but but i think that's a that's a discussion we really need need to have right and uh, i was just checking in with uh yeah that's beautifully said with our tech tech person who i don't know if he's still here he may have left but um we're, we're, we're Brand, at, Brand had to leave program uh two hours comrades right is it is it to it's uh, uh, 434 yes let me, uh, can i speak a moment to peter's point for sure, for sure, yeah. If you guys, uh, because I mean, yeah. that's that's spot on. That's spot on in, in terms of what he said. I mean, and that's what I try to put in context of the brief. You know, whatever we may think about, it, I mean, you can see all kind of criticism about the brief uniting with corrupt politicians. Why is China with the WTO? Blah blah this and blah blah that. And one thing that Lona is absolutely correct on, and that is understanding the level of development of the productive forces. We're in a digital economy. All those shit don't work anymore. Excuse me, I'm sorry. It don't work anymore. We, we, we, and the breed- very scientific. Yeah, the breed is an expression of that. If you read, the, as, as I have, all of the, the, the literature about the Belt and Road, it is China's recognition and they've always recognized this in all iterations that they had, and I see Chi said at the uh, second Belton Forum about the fourth Belton, we got to keep pace with the developments of productive forces and what science does and so forth. And if we don't do that, you know, we, we, can't, we can't understand what's going on. And I know that's the thing that we are struggling with in the collective, how not to put this stuff in boxes, how, how what China is doing, in my estimation, just my own view, is they're bringing, they're doing the Marxism of the 21st century. That's the best way I can describe it. And it, it's hard wrapping your head around it, but when you look at it, it that's what it is. Mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and because it's in real time and constantly developing before our very eyes, you know, it's like what, Ma, like what Marx said in uh, the contribution of profits of political economy, you know, the, we don't get conscious of the problem until all the stuff there for a solution has arrived. And that's what we're catching up with. All so right. Keep right on. Right. David is on second. And if, yeah. if any of the other panelists want to do a quick chat, go ahead, David. Yeah, I just want to correct one thing that it's not just the peasants and the workers and the big bourgeoisie, the United Front also uh, yeah. contains these, the small bourgeoisie, the petty right. bourgeoisie. Also, in terms of Venezuela, if, if there was a great uh, webinar recently on from Multipolarista, and Venezuela is, it may have been slapped, but it ain't down. Mm. Uh, you know, their their oil production now is is going to be greater than it was before the sanctions. Uh, they're they're diversifying their economy, and they're creating socialism with Venezuelan characteristics. Right. You know, and and they're also. And so is Nicaragua uh, and other countries. Every country has to take its own trajectory. Uh, and, I, and so our job, it seems to me, is figuring out what's the trajectory of the United States. You know, thank you. All right, very good. Tobin or Richard or um, anybody else want to give a parting shot? Yeah, the, um, there was a, a comment or a question asked, and I think one of uh, one of our tech group may have answered it right there about uh, is, is Israel part of the BI, BRI? And I, I bring it up, it was a good question. Uh, I bring it up because it brought to mind an article, and I wish I could remember exactly where I read it, that uh, while the, uh, while the, uh, we were trying to engineer a, a big coup in Venezuela, uh, Juan Guaido and company. Uh, there was an article by China, a tentative uh, offer to uh, to talk to and uh, and work with uh, whoever came out on the losing uh, on the winning end of that right there. That was not how they phrased it, but uh, you know whoever emerges, that's who they'd work with, and that kind of that made me perk up right there. I think, can they really be saying what I'm saying? 
-hmm. Then I think about uh, China's commitment to not interfering with the internal politics, but uh, just a practical recognition that uh, Venezuela is going to be a player no matter who's in charge right there. They're the hugest oil producer country. And uh, there there was a time when when it worked more like that. We're, we're kind of on the op in the United States. We're kind of on the on the opposite end of that spectrum right now. We're we're not going to work with anybody we don't like. Right, it's right. killing us. Right. It, it's right. it's killing us. Uh, there there's uh, I don't not, I don't necessarily take that as uh, China approved of what uh, of what uh, Guaido and company were doing. Uh, I'm sure they didn't. Um, that's just my feeling. Um, but you're going to have you're going if you're going to be a, a player and we're we're in globalism. We're we're in a we're in a global economy. If you're gonna be um, if you're gonna be a part of it, you're gonna wind up working with people who probably um, you're not gonna you're not gonna like. But uh, you know the leadership are not the leadership are not uh, representative of the people. Ultimately, what China wants and what uh, what uh, the uh, what their partners want, what the ones their partners would want, is what's best for each of their people, right there. And uh, that's it's it's not just it's not just uh, uh, a a nice a nice sounding thing. That really is a matter. Of, that's a matter of survival, and that's a matter of of, uh, of creating a life for for people. It's essential. All right, uh, Richard, you're muted, brother. You're still muted. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, what what I want to say is I wanted to address this question of not knowing about China. Um, since we since I've joined this collective, I have really uh, got into all, especially because of the internet and it's available uh, with various international news and newspapers and commentators and uh, different various groups. There's a lot of material out there that we don't have to go through, you know, the New York Times or the Washington Post or these, you know, papers like that. There are, there's a lot of information out there on the development of China by the Chinese press and by the Chinese uh, various commissions and uh, spokespeople from the, not only from the government, but from, uh, uh, uh, like I say, intellectuals, uh, analysts. So I just wanna encourage everyone, um, if you wanna know more about this, it's there. Um, we just have to dig for it a little bit. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, comrades. This has been an amazing conversation. I look forward to more of these discussions. And uh, thank you to uh, comrade uh, Corallo Chen for his insight and um, sharing his, his experiences. Um, and I think that's it, right? Uh, yeah? All right, thank you all. This is great. Thank you, Rand, too. We should give him a big round of applause for all the hard work he did. All right. Thank you, sir. Hey, my pleasure. I, I learned so much from all of you. I appreciate you all very much. Thank you, Zoom. And as soon as I edit this, um, we're going to post it on YouTube. So you'll be able to share it with people who wanted to be here but couldn't be here. So great job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Yo. Uzardı yolun köpek zulu mangıda pekat mene mesem tardır koçlar kim dur koçlar raplerimiz de pem bilentem içildi yızıldı sızıldı gap buzulmaydı biz diksep alam kalamdan maharet yok tapkan teginin kuruk söyle tökmet arlaş tekisler ağımızdın hakkını bop derler sendeki mendeki mendeki sendeki sahtığı arlaş maskepler soğuklar öttü baştan acızlık kan bilen yaştan kalemem maciz idiyas aksız içtim bop bir takkasız külürüm tülürüm yalguzluk yüzlürüm közlürüm bop tatuk tırış tırış tırış tırış tırış şu san yalguzluk kat damn bırak motherfucker 就是亚洲中心，你有资格拉进我。